The Olden World Written by Tsar Yoshi Chapter 927 Seven Days of Sailing Day 1 Honestly, it's a bit better without the sweaty guards loafing around. Valet kicked a leg in the air, balanced at her back with a soundstone laying on her belly. We unstacked those extra beds in the bunk cubby, so there's actually room to sleep in them without laying flat on your side. Felicity, you'd still think it's the worst, but it's surprisingly manageable. Glad to hear it, darling, Felicity's voice sounded from the other end. Well, we've been real busy, Amber's voice added. Jam Jars is wandering around being weird, so I've pretty much spent the day tailing her and making sure nothing is going on. And then Shine has got her projects with a ship and meltdown, but aside from that, it's been quiet. Valet nodded along. No Celestia yet? No sign of her, I'm afraid. Yeah, Valet rolled over. Much as you all say she's cool, I kinda want to meet this chick and get a feel for what she's like myself. Still feeling a little iffy about only being there for the meeting using soundstones. Shinespark has discovered, Amber assured. She's doing much better, I think. She might just be working through her issues, and by that, I mean keeping herself working so she doesn't have to deal with them, but still... You can see it in her eyes, you know? She's more determined. I guess Meltdown's just really good for her? Well, he shrugged. Honestly, I sort of wish I could light a fire in her the same way. But not if it comes at the cost of being a damsel in distress. Bananas, I hate doing that. The soundstone crackled for a moment. It's who Shinespark is, Amber replied. She helps ponies less fortunate than her, and that's just hard when she's the one low in fortune. I'd say the best thing you can do for her is support her in that and help her help those others. Goals for when I get home, I guess. Valet kicked tightly again. Not much I can do, aside from encouragement and advice while I'm cooped up on the ship. Scientists say we're making good progress, at least. Wonderful, darling. We're all wishing for your speedy return. Day 2 I've been staring at this long enough to make my eyes fall out, Professor Seastar said, standing in the instrumentation portion of the ship that was no longer off-limits to Starlight and her friends. But ever since I mandated that you four carry all your luggage with you everywhere you go, I'm reasonably certain the harmonic disturbances interfering with our equipment are isolated to the four of you. Um, Maple watched her. As in, all four of us are culprits? Caballero nodded, having adjusted his sleep schedule so that his and Seastar's periods of being off-duty yet awake were aligned. Which is absolutely fantastic, because it tells us nothing at all. On the contrary, my dear professor, Seastar grew a slight smirk, if we can say all of them are harmonically unusual, it supports the hypothesis that northern ponies themselves might be to blame. We're losing out on the functionality of our equipment, but if investigation of this leads to a discovery of biomagical differences between ponies in the north and south? Caballero gave her a look. You do not suppose that relates to why their border is so famously uncrossable, do you? It's possible, Seastar shrugged. Maple cleared her throat. Well, myself and Valet and Starlight all have unusual interactions with magic, but Niala is different too? She's a normal pony. Valet subtly poked her. Except for, uh, the last seven years, you know. Maple blushed. Right, never mind me. Caballero raised an eyebrow at the duo. Sometime it would behoove us to know of these magical differences you already suspect yourself subject to. It could ease our research immensely. Valet yawned and fanned at her mouth. She's got a pony in her cutie mark, I'm a zombie, Niala's been a zombie in multiple different places at the same time, and Starlight punched a goddess monster in the face. Please, Seastar sighed, rolling her eyes. We're trying to be serious here. If you're not going to help, you can keep your secrets. Right now, we have nothing but time. Valet snickered and strolled away. Day 3. I've been thinking, Maple said, laying on her bunk, about what you said yesterday. Our situations really are so absurd, there's nothing we can do short of proving it to make anyone believe us if they're skeptical. Yeah, 
At her loss, Valet hogged a bunk opposite hers, playing with her tail to pass the time. Show me a case where we actually need to convince someone Windigo's are real or whatever for something important, and then we'll solve that problem. Honestly, I like being able to hide behind audacity. Makes me seem cooler if ponies think I can make up stuff like this on the fly. Still though, Maple stared at the ceiling, and got me thinking about how to prove it. And that got me wondering what would happen if we took your pendant off. Valet frowned. I'd probably turn back into a dormant shell like I was before it. And then, if we put it back on, you'd turn back into you. Maple nodded. I was there when it happened. The empty you didn't resist. It's probably something we could do safely if we had any reason to. Why convincing someone? Valet shrugged. Yeah, that would actually probably work out nicely. Maple hesitated. Well, I was also thinking, you know how you used to wear the pendant with Niala because you said it could let you share your body with her? Yeah, she doesn't have any memories of that, Valet huffed. A shame too, because the coolest thing I ever did with her was kicking Herman's rear. Maybe we'd be better friends now if she remembered that. Maple nodded. Well, actually, I was thinking, if you ever have any doubts about yourself being a good pony again, we could always ask Felicity or Niala if they'd like to wear your pendant for a moment and see what you're like without any memories of us at all. Valet blinked hard. That's a little creepy to think about, and kind of intimate for my tastes, you know? You do it to other bad ponies, Maple pointed out. You carried Niala around for a while, when you went through to see who all was in the crate of Moonglass we got in Ironridge. Remember? That time in the tournament where you were doing all that? Yeah, I guess you're right, Valet's tail drooped. I don't know, maybe it's just that I don't worry about that anymore. I'm not a saint, and I'm cool with that, because I don't need to be to keep you guys as friends and be an overall decent pony. Maple glanced away. And it's kind of like how I'm carrying Glimmer in my cutie mark. I wonder if there's any similarity to what I'm holding and what Moonglass holds. Aside from her and Starlight, I've never tried pocketing a pony before. Sounds like you're not eager to change that, Valet replied. It's one of those things you make manageable by not thinking too hard about. And I'll have her out soon. Yeah, four more days. Day four. What are you doing? Niala asked, pacing up behind Valet at the submarine's lone workstation, the biggest and freest space on the ship that was available. Making my brain hurt, Valet poured over an open suitcase, the heavy one she had lugged aboard as a backup. And hopefully making Sparky proud, and hopefully not saving all our rears if stuff goes really south. Niala looked hesitantly over her shoulder. Is that a machine? The suitcase sat open at 90 degrees, an immensely compact amount of mechanics and mana circuitry exposed inside. In fact, the wiring looked to be part of the case itself, like it was less a machine than a suitcase, and more a machine that was designed to close in a clamshell and become portable. It's technical name, Valet grunted, using the spokes on her wings as precision instruments to deal with the insides of the machine, is Karmatech 34. And yeah, you could say that. She stepped back, turning to face Niala and wiping her brow. What's up? Need a hoof? Niala shook her head. I was just curious. She stared past Valet at the suitcase. So that's what the ship's terminal looks like. I've only ever seen it on the inside. Heh, <laughs> Valet chuckled, turning back to the machine. I knew you'd know what this was. Yeah, this is the innards of the ship's terminal that got fried by that Harmony storm while we were crossing the border. I can't believe Sparky's engineers actually stuck an old portable consumer-grade thingamajig like this in that fancy ship of theirs. No wonder it got busted. But hey, that's good for me, because it means I can haul it around and try to fix it up while we wait for this trip to finish. The make and model are more than ten years old, Niala commented. I was surprised to see its specifications too when I connected to it as brain. 
Valet scratched her neck. Yeah, I didn't even know what it was until I pried the dashboard open to get at it and found this thing back there. Maybe it could do everything she needed and she didn't feel like wasting resources and a custom option. Though I'm guessing she liked it for airship purposes because it's small. She tested the hinge and winked. Or because when you close it, it makes a pretty solid table. Niala shook her head. Actually, I bet she did it so she could recover it and carry it and its data with her if the ship ever crashed. The case is very armored. That's part of why it's so heavy. And there were important things on there. Yeah, Valet frowned at the machine, holding a hoof to her chest. Like the schematics for this pendant. You said you're trying to fix it as a backup, Miala said. I don't know if its old memory contents physically exist anymore. It wasn't designed to fly for that storm. Nothing is. That's a big part of why the ship's so broken. Eh, Valet shrugged, flipping a miniature spark gun that was intended for ship hardware repairs. Once upon a time, like three years back, I tried to hack the entire Stone District Defense Force surveillance system. It didn't use this exact same thing, but it was still Karma Tech. That was Dangerous Karma's dad's company. Did Mana Tech stuff, especially power distribution and these things. Corporate family dynasty. Point is, I thought it would be real hilarious to hardwire every single display in the command center to show only cameras I stashed in the Earth District to point at the biggest, best fruit trees I could find. I got away with it for like two days too. So if there's anyone who knows how to hack this thing back into order with brute force, it might be me. Niala bit her lap. Don't get your hopes up too far. If the states on its memory have been wiped by the storm's energy, no amount of skill can bring it back. It's gone. Nah, I'm not too worried. Valet turned back to the machine. Thanks for the concern, and if you want to help, I'm super down. But even if I don't get what I want out of this, I can still get it up and running for Sparky. And if all else fails, bananas, I need a hobby. But I've got a few other ideas for it up my sleeve. Day 5 So there's still no sign of Princess Celestia? I'm afraid there isn't, Miss Maple, Jardo Guillaume replied. I've been cavorting with some of the guards in your absence, and they seem to be getting mildly anxious themselves. They are the ones taking responsibility for us not being back across the border by now, after all. It's a large risk they're taking for us, I understand. All we have to look forward to is instruction on what our futures are permitted to contain. They're the ones who have something to lose. Maple sighed. Well, I hope they're all right. Jaru chuckled. I think that's a first for you. How far we've come in the world that we're hoping for God's safety rather than being run ragged by them, hmm? I've forgiven you for getting me arrested in Einridge, but don't press your luck, Maple warned. That was not how I dreamed of starting my adventuring career. How many times did you say you've been arrested, Gerardo? Slipstream's voice chimed in. You were just telling me the story the other day. Anywhere between 5 and 18, depending on a large number of definitions and technicalities, Gerardo replied. Scrapes with the 40s tend to be a staple of adventuring, particularly in Varsidel, where the authority tends to be whichever faction has the most fighters and weapons. Well, that's... Maple sighed. She had no clue if it was different. That sounds stressful. It becomes a badge of honor after some time. You have enough clothes shaves under your belt to count as well, do you not? Imagine the day when we settle down, form lives and friendships with non-adventuring civilians, and you get to serenade their wandering eyes with tales of the first time you got arrested assisting with the smuggling of contraband cargo. Maple almost gave a good-natured retort, and then blinked. Wait, we settle down? I thought you were... planning on adventuring more? Slipstream cut in. Well, it's not like we'll be starting a family and settling down. I mean, Griffin and Pegasus, but... Gerardo cleared his throat. Lest I was aware, the plan was to found our town on that plot of land you obtained in Grand Bell, yes? 
The one we could use as a fuel source for our ship? Or a new one based on the same technology? I don't see myself losing my love for the horizon anytime soon, but I can absolutely see us turning such a town into a home base of sorts. Come back, refuel, spend a week swapping stories, fly out and return again four months later. True, there would be goodbyes and we wouldn't spend all our time there, but I think it could be called a home. Heh, <laughs> Maple wiped the corner of her eye. On days like these, that dream sounds more and more like it's just around the corner. Day 6 That's it! Valet strolled into the room where Niala, Maple and Starlight were crowded around a tiny lunch table, tucking the soundstone back beneath her hat. News of the day! Sparky's work is going well, ship is half disassembled and looks like a skeleton, Gazelle hasn't stopped breaking into the archives, Jam Jars is apparently living in the laughter dorm now because some kids took pity on her and gave her a room, Felicity is shockingly a week more pregnant than she was when we left, and still no Princess Celestia. One more day, and we'll be in and out of that palace before she actually arrives. Maple blinked. It both feels like it's been forever, and no time at all. Niala nodded. I'm almost afraid of us arriving. It's not a place I want researched. And I will go to bat for you the moment our science friends poke their noses Anywhere they don't belong, Valet promised, stepping around her and taking a seat in the middle. Personal news for me, that Karmatech 34 is as restored as it's going to get. Should be able to load new data, but you are right about the old stuff. It's gonzo. Oh well, biggest shame is I won't have it to work on for the trip back. Uh, she nudged Maple's cutie mark. Hope we'll be busy messing with our new friend instead. Niala looked uneasily at the interaction. You know, Maple said, we probably need to talk about how we're getting inside, don't we? Sea Star, Caballeron, and Anemone are counting on us to have a plan for entry. Starlight shrugged. The other trees have responded to my magic. The first one even made an opening in the castle wall for us to climb through when we came back the second time, remember? Maybe I can ask it to let us in. The lady nodded at her. Pretty sure we don't know enough about what we're up against to have a concrete plan, and pretty sure this is the kind of magic plans don't work on anyway. But Starlight's probably right. If we're supposed to be there, I suspect it'll just work. And if not, well, the place is intelligent, right? One more day then, Maple held out a hoof. We are going to get that filly back and get some answers about this bad future. Valet bumped it, but didn't draw back. We're gonna own her, and make her tell us as much as we need for Starlight to be happy again. Hesitantly, Starlight joined her hoof to the joint pile. I like that. Valet glanced at Niala. All right, Niala slowly added hers. If you're thinking about bad futures, though, messing too much with the root of the world might be a good way to cause one. Yeah, Valet's brow shadowed. That's why, no matter what we find, we're gonna keep that place protected and not just leave a way back in. But fortunately, I think the professors know how gnarly that could be too. Day 7 All of you should be prepared, Anemone advised, passing through to the cockpit from the instrument room. The livestream's readings are growing much stronger, enough to overpower some of the interference. We're very close. Is there a way to see what's outside? Starlight asked, stepping forward. I might need to see it to get us in. Anemone nodded. We'll turn the panel in the lunchroom to the underwater camera feeds, but I'd guess it's less than an hour away. Guess again, Caballero's voice called from the cockpit. I believe we are nearer than you think. Valet, Niala, and Maple rushed ahead, but Starlight stayed put, closing her eyes and concentrating. They were low. They had been low for a while, but now, brushing the seafloor? She couldn't quite feel the life stream like she had before, but knew they were close. Is that a canyon? Maple's surprised voice came from ahead. 
An undersea ravine, Seastar's voice confirmed. The seafloor is deep, but the structure we found is deeper still. It's at the bottom of that. Descending, Caballero confirmed. Stalic ran to the cockpit as well, stopping in the lunchroom and staring at the display on the wall. The entire seafloor was flat, strewn with a carpet of kelp and sea life so thick it had to have some unnatural energy source to survive. And that source manifested itself in the form of a tear in the ground, long and jagged, that rose up around them as they slowly descended. The camera feed was bright, but it wasn't the ship's illumination she soon realized. It was the canyon walls. Slow, sluggish traces of midnight blue energy welled up along them, bleeding through veins in the rock on an inexorable journey to the surface. She had seen these before, in the Iron Ridge Palace, very near the bottom. Why were they always midnight blue? The flames had colors of their own. Whatever this was had to come from the life stream. Twin, uncomfortable realizations that probably meant nothing pressed in on her at once. Midnight blue was her color, the color she always remembered flashes of after pushing herself far, far past her limits, and the lights were far brighter here than they had been in the north. Shouldn't the water have dimmed them? What if it was dimming them and they were just that much brighter? Did that mean that here, the energy given off by the life stream was stronger than it was in the north? The Ark Manta sank rapidly, the sound of its engine changing as it worked to keep pressure constant despite the change in depth. Starlight kept her eyes fixed on the screen, until a tiny light drew her attention downwards, shining up for the floor like a faint orange star. Hadn't there been one of these in Iron Ridge, too? It was another Tree of Harmony, and it was calling her. Starlight was coming. End of Chapter 927